Good morning and thank you uh, for, well, I want to throw out a, a thanks first to Lucy Haslam and her entourage who are so um, generous and skillful at, uh, at putting on this conference. I appreciate it very much, the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Jeff Hergen, rather. I'm a physician in California. I have been uh, practicing uh, cannabinoid medicine for uh, just about 20 years. I, um, I'm also the president of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. We're in a group that's rapidly growing worldwide. It's mostly California physicians, but actually we're changing right, you know, as we speak to more of a national uh, presence where doctors all over the country are, are wanting to become members so that they can learn more about medicinal use of cannabis. And that is including a, a chapter of our organization here in Australia, which uh, we'll talk about later on this afternoon. But uh, we do have quite a rapidly growing group of doctors with the needs that you're describing in this last session of physicians who really want to know from other doctors. So we collaborate with one another and we put on educational events so that we can stay up to date. We also uh, have a uh, online CME program, continuing medical education so that doctors can get training uh, online as well. Uh, I have no financial uh, relationships to disclose. You know, my practice really dates back about 40 years to when I was a, a young doc on a commune and their cannabis was revered, though illegal. We revered cannabis and we just felt that uh, we had an opportunity to use cannabis. Patients would come to me and we, we heard this story yesterday. The patients were educating the doctor about the medicinal use of cannabis. So my first seizure patient would come to me and say, gee, doc, when I'm able to use cannabis on a regular pa basis, this is really helping. I'm not having seizures. And then condition after condition, I became aware of the, of the wide range of effects of cannabis long before it was really described in the literature. So here we have a, a, a little image of what, uh, what literature is out there, cannabinoids from 1980 to 1993, 3,900 citations, since then 66,000. So a huge amount of information is out there uh, really uh, demonstrating uh, in many cases the efficacy and the safety of cannabis in um, in the cannabinoid system and in, in the endocannabinoids. Uh, here too, 1980 to 1993, 287 citations for endocannabinoids and since then over 38, uh, 31,000. So to say that we don't know enough about it is really bunk. You know, we know a huge amount about it. We've been trained through the last 20, 30 hours in uh, endocannabinoid systems, so I don't need to elaborate on the details here, but this is about an endogenous system that helps us to eat, sleep, relax, both physically and mentally, uh, forget uh, in a good kind of way. Uh, memory extinction is based on the cannabinoid system and when it doesn't work well we have problems such as PTSD and then patients that dwell constantly on their pain and their problems similarly cannabis is very helpful for them to get the the problem off of their sleeve to relax and forget about it for a while protecting a vast number of roles of protection uh, which I won't read uh, item by item, but just understand that this endocannabinoid system is there to protect us. This is just a list of some of the pharmacologic effects of the cannabinoids. Uh, again, I won't read them uh, individually, but understand that because of the location of these receptors throughout the nervous system and the immune system, there's vast number of roles, and this you know, really brings to light uh, how it could work so well in so many different conditions. These receptors are in these positions in our body to bring about homeostasis. There is a natural activation of the endocannabinoid system by cellular stress, and uh, then the effort is the body reestablishes this cellular home homeostasis by way of the endocannabinoid system. The natural cannabinoids are metabolized locally for the most part. And then the plant cannabinoids, uh, we should understand, are not broken down locally, but they are uh, metabolized in the liver. And I'll show more about this in a few minutes. 
this just points to the range of the animals in the animal kingdom that have an endocannabinoid system. We know from hydra to humans, the evidence is in the genetics, in the genes, that the system is there and it's functioning to bring about these various roles in all animals, excepting insects, but you see the hydra and the sea squirts and the fish, and it would include the amphibians and the, and the uh, reptiles as well as all of the, ma the mammal, uh, mammals as well. If we radioactively label the cannabinoids, there they are in high concentration in these receptors in these parts of the brain shown. And without really enumerating those spots, I think you've been hearing about them, the amygdala and the hippocampus and the hypothalamus and the cerebrum and the cerebellum and so forth. They are there uh, doing their various roles. And in the rest of the body, in the CB2 side, they are uh, over time shown as uh, zero at the time of injection where they rapidly congregate in the liver and then as we go 11 minutes, 27, 47, and 102 minutes down the line left to right, we see how these are concentrated in the organs, the liver, the spleen, uh, up in the neck, in the tonsils and adenoids, the lymph nodes, uh, the skeleton is quite rich in cannabinoids, uh, as well as the skin, which you don't really see in this particular image, but the skin is also rich in cannabinoid uh, receptors. Uh, enumerating, they are listed here, the CB1s on the left, uh, and the distal nerve endings throughout the body. And in the CB2s, in the immune system, the monocytes, the macrophages, the B cells, T cells, antibody generating cells, liver, spleen, tonsils, and then also rich collections of the CB2s, more or less as needed in the GI tract and in the central nervous system. This was explained yesterday. I just think it's very important to understand it. I won't dwell too long on it. Glutamate in this case is the neurotransmitter with a very uh, light action potential. There's no glutamate of any significance released into the cleft, but as the signaling picks up, the glutamate is released, it crosses the cleft, finds the uh, glutamate receptors on the postsynaptic cell and propagates the signal. Well, at this point, the natural cannabinoids are being produced, uh, demonstrated here on the lower right. They're crossing the cleft in a retrograde fashion to find the cannabinoid CB1 receptors. And from there, once activated, the CB1 receptor will stop the production and the release of the neurotransmitter. So a very convenient break on the system. There's literature on the um, excitotoxicity being blocked by the cannabinoids, so this is protecting our cells from excessive activity, which would really effectively burn them up, so the natural cannabinoids are there to do the job. Now, the plant cannabinoids are activating, well, THC specifically is activating this CB1 receptor. Uh, the CBD is a valuable uh, cannabinoid, plant cannabinoid, but it does not do that. It gets into the receptor, but it does not activate the cannabinoid receptor. So when we have both of the molecules there, we really have a more effective medicine. The uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA is similarly um, modulated by the uh, cannabinoid system. So whether it's an excitatory or an inhibitory circuit, it is similarly protected by the cannabinoids. So they are throughout the brain and the body doing this particular role. In the immune system, it's not so easy to characterize what's going on. We can say that there's abundant evidence indicating cannabinoids modulate immune responses and activation effectively downregulates the immune activity without compromising the efficacy of the system. Uh, a couple pieces of research that uh, point toward this. One of them is uh, really basic science with the Nagarkotis in the University of South Carolina showing that when um, they transfect organs or tissues into mice after disabling their immune system, giving THC will protect those organs from the host versus graft reaction. So in my patients with, uh, with organ transplants, I've been hearing for ten, well, many years now that the docs are very happy with their transplants and their, 
their therapies because they don't seem to need much medication, the immunomodulator medicines, they're using cannabis on a regular basis and it does seem to have this protective role. Naturally, it'd be great to see some clinical research, but this is a topic that I'll be talking about some tomorrow. Uh, in monkeys, uh, this was a very interesting piece of research that came out of uh, Mississippi, uh, Winsauer and group. They took a, a bunch of macaque monkeys and infected them with something comparable to the HIV virus, the SIV virus. And half of these animals, they gave an injection of THC2 on a daily basis. And those animals showed a amelioration of disease progression, attenuation of viral load and tissue infl inflammation, significantly reducing the morbidity and the mortality of the SIV infected macaques. So again, here's THC really protecting the animal from the progression of the SIV virus. So we can understand from this simple research granted in a, in a monkey that we're not harming the immune system with cannabinoids. In fact, we're heightening its sensitivity and its, uh, in its effectiveness in really dealing with a, a, a disease that is going to eventually kill these other macaque monkeys. So let's look a moment at the receptor itself. This is a, what's called a, ter a secondary and a tertiary uh, image of what we think this receptor looks like. The CB1 is shown with the blue dots, each dot being an amino acid, and the uh, greenish color is the CB2 receptor. In both cases, these receptors kind of clump into a a lump that makes its way from the interior of the cell into the cell membrane where it sets up shop as the active receptor. And the receptor is then opened for business by having the cannabinoids fit into it and activate this vast number of roles that it does in terms of inflammation and so forth. Uh, so what we know from basic science is if we can change just one amino acid in that, in that chain we can affect the function of this receptor. It does not work as well. So it's a very sensitive uh, receptor in that regard. And what we know from, um, from our research since that time is that our genetics show that we do have these polymorphisms or genetic variability in our endocannabinoid receptors, uh, which do affect the functionality of our endocannabinoid system. They don't all work the same. So I've got patients that'll come to me and say, Doc, I've, you know, tw here's a 28-year-old daughter and her 50-ish-year-old mom, and they come in, and they've both got MS, and they've both got, both got rheumatoid arthritis, and they've go both got Crohn's disease. And I'm going, you know, I can hardly believe this, but it points to a likelihood that these are endocannabinoid deficiencies. This problem is just... It's something they cannot uh, deal with in terms of the progression of these various diseases that are thought to be endocannabinoid uh, deficiency syndromes. So this is a possible list then of, of human endocannabinoid deficiency syndromes. It dates back to a paper over 10 years ago by Ethan Russo, and you can see the list here of those, that, uh, those conditions that are proposed as endocannabinoid deficiencies. I would be adding to this list inflammatory bowel disease and sleep disorders and some other uh, common problems that I think are likely to also be endocannabinoid deficiencies. So we have natural ways of upregulating our endocannabinoid system, exercise, massage, manipulation, and acupuncture. They can temporarily, briefly upregulate the endocannabinoid system. And then metabolites of acetaminophen, uh, paracetamol, I believe it is here, and, um, and some of the NSAIDs, the metabolites alter the metabol met metabolism of your natural cannabinoid uh, enzymes. We saw yesterday FA is the fatty acid amide hydrolase. It breaks down anandamide. Well, if you have acetaminophen or the NSAIDs around, they are going to alter that metabolic pathway and effectively upregulate your natural cannabinoids, which may at least be in part uh, a mechanism of action of why these medicines do work as they do in reducing pain and inflammation. 
and of course various pathologic conditions will upregulate the endocannabinoid system as well through in injury and illness we do see that so the feds know this in the United States very well. This is a paper that came out about four years ago from the NIH uh, by Pocker and Kunos. Modulating endocannabinoid activity may have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans. Strong words, including, and then the laundry list of conditions, diabetes, ob obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes and diabetic complications, neurodegenerative, inflammatory, cardiovascular, liver, gastrointestinal, skin diseases, pain, psychiatric disorders, cachexia, cancer, chemotherapy-induced nausea, vomiting, and many others. So again, it's not that the feds don't know that the cannabinoids have this role in, in health and, and disease, but they also are looking to the pharmaceutical industry to bring us a generation of new medications and not looking at the cannabis plant and its derivatives as the medicine. So here we are using the plant as our medicine. Now we do have some, some products that are available. Dronabinol or Marinol is available. Uh, it is synthetic Delta 9 THC in two, five, and 10 milligram capsules in sesame oil. We have Nabilone that's also a synthetic 9 uh, TH, uh, a Delta 9 THC. It seems to be a little stronger in the particular formulation that it is. Uh, in so that uh, a milligram is a dose. And then the nabiximol, nab, nabiximols are the Sativex products that are coming along, but uh, they've hit some problems in their phase three clinical trials in the United States. They decided that they needed to do a trial on terminal cancer pain. Well, you know, if you were gonna really look at the effect of nabiximols, I don't know that I would select that particular group of patients to uh, look at. And so they not, are not getting good trial results with these uh, near-death patients for whatever reason I can't explain. Uh, we also, um, so we're waiting to see if nabiximols will make it into the uh, medications in the United States. They are available in about 30 countries worldwide, but we don't have them in the USA. Uh, we do have um, a, a variety of um, plant uh, well, here's Epidiolex. I can see my slide kind of uh, changed position a bit. But Epidiolex is the uh, CBD-rich uh, product that is, has been afforded this uh, uh, status in the United States to where we can use it for pediatric seizures. It is 99% CBD and 1% non-THC cannabinoids. That, was, that takes a, a chemical chemistry effort to remove every trace of THC from this medicine. This is a political reason to take the THC out. From when I was speaking 40 years ago of seeing my first patients with seizure disorders, it was the THC-rich cannabis that was doing the job and, and really doing a, a, a great job at actually preventing seizures. So we know THC is a good anticonvulsant, but again, it's taken out of the medicine uh, with Epidiolex for political reasons. So when I'm treating kids with p uh, pediatric seizures or anybody with a seizure disorder, I'm making an effort to get something closer to a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD as it seems to be a better medicine and work better. And in the pediatric seizure population where we start with high doses of CBD often, and if we don't find the results after we start getting the milligram per kilogram per day uh, up, into an effective dose, we start adding a milligram at a time of THC in order to really change the, uh, the way that this medicine works and make a much better medicine in many cases. This is the argument for why synthetic THC or dronabinol is not your best choice. It is a single isolated synthetic cannabinoid, one of well, it might be 104 active cannabinoid constituents. If we're talking to Deddy, I think it may be 140 some odd uh, cannabinoids that have been isolated at this point. But you get my point. It is just one single molecule. It lacks the synergistic effects of the multiple cannabinoids, flavonoids, and terpene molecules that are there in the whole plant. You should understand at this point that the non-THC components of the plant possess various therapeutic properties and this is just a brief list of some of them, neuroprotection, bone stimulating, antipsychotic, antiepileptic, antibacterial, antidiabetic, 
vasorelaxant, anxiolytic, antispasmodic, and analgesic, and so forth. So the, if you really look at these molecules, you're going to find an extensive list of therapeutic uses of these other molecules, both the terpenes and the cannabinoids, making it really a, a softer medicine so it doesn't have the harshness of single molecule THC, but also really a more effective medicine in many ways. When patients are offered the choice of single molecule dronabinol versus a whole plant extract, they uniformly choose the whole plant extract. It's a better medicine and better tolerated. So we look to the plant as the way we are modulating the endocannabinoid system. We have the flowering tops and the keef and the hashish. We have the oils uh, that have been extracted either with usually alcohol or supercritical CO2 extraction. We have tinctures or cannabis oils and infused oils as well. It's simple to take your medicine at the time of harvest, whether it's been dried or green, and plunge it into olive oil or into alcohol, depending on what you're after as an end product. If you're putting it into olive oil or other oils, you have an infused oil after a, a not a long time of exposure of these oils on the flowering tops to the olive oil, where it infuses into the oil. Now you have a medicine that you can take by mouth with a dropper, and a dose might be in the range of a half a teaspoon or less. So you can make a nice potent medicine for yourself just with the plants that you're growing in your yard. We also have, um, well, and then if you put it into grain alcohol, you can extract it and then reduce the alcohol and get down to these very concentrated uh, full extract cannabis oils that are common, commonly used in the cancer patients where you want to get up to very high doses. We have salves and various uh, topicals. Suppositories are something that I'll talk a little bit more about, but blending with either uh, cocoa butter or with polyethylene glycol, we can make suppositories where these oils are now going to be in contact with the rectal mucosa, and some absorption occurs. This is an area where we could use a lot of help from the government in saying, let's look. We do know that THC as a single molecule is not absorbed through the rectal mucosa in suppository studies that were done 20 years ago. It just is not absorbed well. But we don't know anything about the full extract cannabis oil where we have a, a, a lot of different molecules there. And so the solvents that would be the terpene fraction, may assist in, in getting these molecules across the mucosa. In any case, uh, clinically, we see good effects with the suppositories, but we just don't have the research to really show the best way to blend these in order to get the best uh, absorption. We do note that the uh, psychoactivity is greatly reduced. As you get into the rectal mucosa, you're in the, the watershed between the the portal venous circulation that goes from the esophagus to the rectum, and then above and below that, you're absorbing into the body in a different way. Everything from the portal vein goes to the liver first, but you get into the rectum, you're gonna start to absorb through the vena cava and the blood coming in from the lower extremities and avoid this first pass metabolism, which also I'll speak a bit more about in a minute. Of course, we have food and beverages and candies and capsules, and I think as long as things are properly labeled and properly packaged, we're going to avoid some of the risks of accidental overdoses of medication. This slide is a little out of date already. It is from ISO in 2009. I, I included it. It looks good, and it's just showing about uh, five or ten of the different non-psychotropic uh, plant cannabinoids and some of their uh, some of their uh, roles in, in, um, in medicine. So they are anti-proliferative and they are anti-spasmodics. And again, this is just reinforcing the fact that many of these non-psychotropic cannabinoids have a vast number of uh, pharmacologic actions that we're relying on. Now, the entourage effect we've spoken of, and I don't know that I need to, to you know, go as far as reading uh, this page, but the combined effect of the of all of these cannabinoids and the terpenoids do give this ensemble of a more effective medicine than the single molecules. So uh, practically speaking, when we get into to designing a treatment plan for patients, 
we really look mostly to the THC or THCA and the cannabidiol as the relevant molecules in designing a treatment plan. This will come along in time because we do have THCV and CBDV and, and uh, other uh, cannabinoids of significance that will be valuable in terms of their pharmacologic actions. But for now, we kind of limit it to the THC and the CBD by and large. The terpenes, which we'll learn more about with Dr. Sexton's afternoon talk, are biologically active constituents. They too have numerous pharmacologic effects. They give the plant its fragrance, as you probably recognize the, tea, the cannabinoids are odorless and colorless, and the fragrant molecules are the terpenes. Uh, generally, these uh, terpenes are considered uh, recognized as safe by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. They are slowly lost to evaporation, so if you smell them, you're losing them. So the plant is rich in them at the harvest time. Again, this was demonstrated uh, by Deddy yesterday in terms of the difference in time that these, these uh, oils are harvested. They are cranked out you know, very systematically by the plant for their various roles. They're insecticides. They provide some protection from UV radiation and so forth and so forth. So the plant is smart, delivers these molecules to the surface and then they are uh, used uh, uh, to the benefit of the plant. Uh, to optimize the absorption of terpenes, cannabis must be inhaled. This is something that I, I would probably just reinforce because uh, we think of these uh, terpenes as being just uniformly available. By the time we get to the extracted oils, and in many cases the oils that are in the in the tinctures, many of these terpenes have been lost. If you put them up to your nose, you're not gonna smell anything like what it smelled like when you smell the whole plant. So as these oils are being prepared, often they're being uh, heated in their processing, they uh, lose a great deal of their terpene fraction. So you do not have the same medicine that you had when it started out. So to optimize the terpene effects, you really need to inhale them inhale them through vaporizers or through smoking. Uh, oral terpene bioavailability is considered to be very low. Uh, they're probably broken down right from the time they hit the stomach acids, but also by the time they go through the liver, the terpenes are largely broken down. We don't have a lot of terpene effect by the time it gets uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, dermal absorption is rapid. We see some ma maximum concentrations in 10 minutes, but then they're gone as well. They're rapidly metabolized. Uh, some therapeutic properties of the terpenes, this is a very brief listing, but, uh, and we've seen this some yesterday as well, and I, I won't read them, but here's terp uh, the pinene has a variety of effects, limonene, linalool, myrcene, caryophylline, neurolidol, humulene, you know, this is a few of the dominant terpenes numbering as many as 200 are found in the plant. So you look at the dominant terpenes and you can, you know, can count on adding some other pharmacologic properties to the medicine. This is just to take a moment to look at the structure of these molecules. This is THC, uh, position number two on the upper uh, right side of the molecule is where the carboxyl group is in the acid forms of the plant cannabinoids. That is to say, when, th when, when THC is in the living plant, it is in the, uh, in the um, THCA form. I'm sorry, that's another slide coming up in, in a short time. But here's CBD on the lower left, uh, down um, at that position number six, where the molecule is altered by moving a hydrogen atom over to the ring, opening the ring, and that's CBD. It's the same atomic formula, it's just a very subtle difference that is created by an enzyme to produce CBD. These don't go back and forth and they're not altered in the body from one to the other. This is what you get depending on the, the uh, strain of cannabis that you're using. I've shown THCV just for interest here. I think it's uh, particularly uh, interesting to note that the THCV is virtually identical to the THC above it, except it has a shorter tail. 
So this side chain is now three carbons long instead of five carbons long. If you think about the receptor again, the tail doesn't get deep enough into the receptor in order to provide the, the agonist role. It does not activate, THCV does not activate the cannabinoid receptor. It may to some degree in very high concentrations, but in low concentrations, it actually acts more of a blocker to the cannabinoid receptor. So in optimizing our uh, clinical effects of cannabinoids, we look at how we're going to administer it, dosage, frequency of use, and then the cannabinoid ratios. So for methods of administration, we've talked over the days here about smoke and vapor. Bioavailability ranges vastly from 2% to 56% in one study. Uh, this was published in Houston, Maryland Houston's paper in 2007. In another study, it was 10 to 25 percent. So you can imagine that if somebody is just taking a pipe or a joint and taking a puff on it or a vaporizer and then, you know, being very casual and blowing it out readily, you're not going to get more than a couple percent absorption or bioavailability of, the, of these molecules. Whereas if you're holding it in and really holding your breath and keeping this, the vapor or smoke in your lungs, you're going to get a much greater bioavailability. Again, absorbing that first pass metabolism of going to the liver first where it's largely broken down. The oral forms are so shown to be bioavailability of 10 to 20 percent in one study, 4 to 20 percent in another, and 6 percent in a cookie study. These are quite low and I, I'll show some graphs in a minute to uh, help explain this. Let me go back a moment to say that the topical and transdermal, there is minimal absorption. Uh, there are patents in the U.S. Patent Office using DMSO and terpenes as vehicles to bring these cannabinoids across the skin through the aqueous layers to get them absorbed. But in general, the cannabinoids are not well absorbed through the skin. Uh, I've mentioned rectal uh, use of cannabinoids as suppositories. They can be used vaginally as well. Their bioavailability, according to Hustis, was twice the oral route. Again, though, this was using a THC hemisuccinate. So when they found 20 years ago that THC was not well absorbed at all in the rectal mucosa, they began to look for what other molecules they could blend it with to improve absorption. And they found an ester, this hemisuccinate, that they bind to the THC so that it helps facilitate the crossing of the mucosal uh, border into the, into the bloodstream. There it's cleaved and the THC then is active in the body. And according to Hustis, the bioavailability is twice that of the oral route. So we can get molecules into the system. Uh, through uh, suppositories. Uh, we could use some help from, you know, the government easing up our regulations so that we could study this in a more effective way to find how we could be preparing this without going through a pharmaceutical company in order to improve the bioavailability and absorption of these molecules. Delivery methods. This just is going through a little bit of uh, detail of this and smoke and vapor. Uh, either flowers or vaporizers. The onset is very rapid, and this is one of our really valuable points in this. If you're relieving pain or anxiety or panic or whatever, and inhaling the cannabis is a very effective method of administration. The weaknesses do include the fact that it is a pulmonary irritant, uh, and it may simply be inappropriate in people with pulmonary disease, such as the asthmatics or people treating other conditions in the lung. Uh, it's broadly applicable to all kinds of medical conditions, the smoke and vapor. Honestly, in my population, I would say something in the range of about 70% of my patients that I've been following for 20 years still prefer, prefer smoking as their preferred method of administration. It works well, it's easy to titrate, and they like the effect. And again, if you're looking for all those terpene effects, you're going to get them with smoke and vapor, and you're not necessarily going to get them when you're in, ingesting uh, cannabis by um, the enteral route. Oral mucosal is interesting. If you spray a product into the mouth and hold it into the, under the tongue or inside of the lip, you do begin to absorb some of this. How well has not been measured? We do not have these studies either to see what kind of uh, bioavailability we really get from the oral mucosa route. 
We know from the SATAVEX data, they say that a, a beginning of onset of action is somewhere between five and 40 minutes. When they're saying 40 minutes, to me that means, okay, it made it down the esophagus, through the stomach, and into the duodenum where it's mixing with bile acids, and now it's absorbing quite well. That's going to take a half hour or 40 minutes. So uh, most of the oral mucosa is not really absorbed directly uh, across the mucosal membranes, but ends up getting in through the gut. Enteral, we got capsules and edibles, tinctures. Uh, their strength is that they're convenient and they are long term in long duration. Uh, the weakness is it can be erratic in the bioavailability. What you eat at the time of taking your cannabis product orally makes a difference. It's said that empty stomach is not actually the best way to get it absorbed, nor would be a large bulky meal. But what I tend to suggest to people if they're taking it orally is a small fatty meal might be a best choice. Take it with some chocolate, take it with some ice cream, take it with a little snack, something to where you have a little bit of something in the stomach and it seems to be relatively uh, stable in, in delivery. Uh, here's topicals, um, salves and liniments. Uh, I love using it topically. There are so many applications that uh, it, it could be a lecture of its own, but certainly we do know that when you take the concentrated cannabis oils and put them on skin lesions, any of the aging lesions, the keratoses and so forth, as well as some of the skin cancers, if you put these concentrated oils on these lesions, they will in many cases disappear over the course of a few weeks of constant uh, therapy. So they're very useful in this way. I do make a point of saying that if you think you have a melanoma, run to the surgeon and get it cut off. This is not something that you want to start with cannabinoid therapy. After you get it cut off, then use your cannabinoids as well. And I've seen some great responses uh, in people that waited too long, ended up uh, with metastatic melanomas, and have had excellent results to high-dose cannabinoids in terms of disappearance of the metastases. So it does seem to have some value uh, as far as melanoma is concerned. But again, get the melanoma cut off right away. Transdermal uh, patches, I think they are something yet to be uh, developed. There are some. There's one in Denver called Mary's Medicinals. Uh, I think that the absorbability is reasonably good. Uh, bioavailability is good. You're avoiding first pass metabolism. But it may be difficult to really find the proper dosage and get the strength that you're after. Uh, these will come along with time. And again, I don't think I need to elaborate on the rectal absorption uh, or strengths and weaknesses. I believe we've adequately covered this. So for other, uh, the next thing would be the dosage and frequency of administration. This has to do everything to, with the metabolism. And the plant cannabinoids are metabolized by the liver in the cytochrome P450 system. Uh, genetic variations from person to person uh, in these metabolic pathways are manifest as either slow, intermediate, or fast metabolizers. So I tell a person, if you take a dose at bedtime and you're still feeling it the next morning, you're probably a slow metabolizer and you're going to have to adjust your treatment plan accordingly. Whereas if somebody takes a dose at bedtime and they're feeling refreshed and had a good night's sleep and wake up with no psychoactivity whatsoever, they're probably a rapid metabolizer. Most people seem to be. When we're dealing with really high doses of cannabinoids, uh, that has to play into it as well because it takes uh, longer before these are fully metabolized. Uh, cannabidiol is um, metabolized by the C, uh, cytochrome 3A and 2C19 pathways. This is the same as one of the anticonvulsants, uh, clobazam, and so you have to follow your blood levels of clobazam if you're giving high doses of CBD. In lower doses of CBD, no worries, but in high dose CBD, which you might be getting to with these doses that we're seeing used in seizure disorders, then you're going to want to follow these uh, blood levels of not only clobazam, but probably all the uh, anticonvulsant AEDs in order to know if you're in the proper range. Otherwise, there is no significant drug-drug interaction between cannabinoids and other medications. 
So I want to spend a minute on these graphs. This is the graph for smoked cannabis. It would probably be just the same for vaporized cannabis. You'll see the dotted line is the THC with a rapid spike at about 10, 5 to 10 minutes. You get a peak at about 150 nanograms per ml or micrograms per liter. And then it falls rapidly over the first hour. You get a little blip in the dashed line of the 11-hydroxy. That is the first pass metabolite in the liver. So as THC enters the bloodstream through the pulmonary circulation and has no first pass metabolism, but it does get pumped then through the hepatic artery into the liver where it's being metabolized, now we're seeing this little blip in 11-hydroxy. Over the years, we've assumed that 11-hydroxy THC and, C and THC are probably of comparable psychoactivity. This has never been studied either. It would be nice to know. There was a paper that came out just a year ago that suggested that 11-hydroxy might be nine or 10 times more psychoactive than THC. And certainly in the overdoses of brownies that we historically hear about, this is probably the 11-hydroxy that we're feeling. I'll show that to you in the next graph. But the solid line is this 11 nor 9 carboxy THC. This is abbreviated THC with the carboxyl group uh, next to it. It's the solid line and it is pharmacologically inactive. It's doing nothing for us. It shows up, it lasts a long time. The only, buddy, only person that really likes this would be law enforcement. It lingers in your body for days. But you'll see that most of the active constituents are gone within an hour. Really, by three hours, they're gone. So we can rely on it for that quick burst of effect, and then it's going to be metabolized and ineffective, though it will linger for days. Uh, in review, most THC is eliminated over one hour. Duration of action is about two to three hours. Going on to the ingested curve, quite a different looking curve. Again, the solid line is the 11 nor 9 carboxy, the inactive metabolite. So now, again, everything is being collected by the portal vein, going to the liver first, and the liver is very efficient at breaking these molecules down, mostly at that 11 position up on the upper left of the molecule that I showed a while ago, uh, where it is combined with uh, hydroxyl groups and other uh, molecules in order to break it down you'll see the THC is the lowest of the curves, and the 11-hydroxy is much higher. It's said that of the active ingredients, THC is just 20%, and 11-hydroxy is 80% of the active constituents after it gets through the liver and into the bloodstream. So here, this is an average of six people's curves. Some people are gonna be done at about six hours and other people may last 12 hours. So again, you have to be able to work with your patient at understanding that we don't know yet how fast you're gonna metabolize and we're gonna to have to adjust the frequency of dosing based on that information. So again, note that about 90% of the cannabinoids that you've put in the mouth are inactivated before you ever get to use them. Sad but true. Nothing to do about that that I know of. Uh, so in review, THC is eliminated over five to eight hours with the duration of action somewhere in really more like five to 10 hours or 12 hours before it's uh, inactivated. So dosing and frequency, we have a wide range from a few milligrams a day of cannabinoids to hundreds of milligrams a day of cannabinoids. Uh, I've been using the THC-rich cannabis with my patient population up until just the last few years when THC has sort of, uh, well, I should say CBD has taken favor as something to try, especially if you don't want to have the psychoactivity. Uh, I also will coach people along and say, you may need to accept that there's some psychoactivity associated with getting the best effect. So it depends on the condition that we're treating and how much THC we may need to add. And then frequency of dosing, of course, may range from as needed. Some people use it quite episodically and may you know, have a migraine headache now and then, and they don't necessarily use cannabis all the time. They may take a bedtime dose, and seem to have a prophylactic effect that way, but otherwise they may use it episodically if they feel a headache coming on. 
Uh, daily administration is pretty common. I would say probably the majority of my patients will report something in the range of five to six or seven days per week they're using some cannabinoids. So it's variable. Uh, other people are using it multiple times daily depending on the condition that they're dealing with. So uh, seizure disorders and you know, severe pain. These people are using cannabinoids throughout the day and it's something that you just don't worry about. It doesn't, they can come and go from the use of cannabinoids quite readily. There's no significant withdrawal syndrome. There's no addiction per se and they use it regularly in order to achieve the effect that they're after. Cannabinoid ratios, again, THC and CBD are the dominant ones in most preparations, but as the acid cannabinoids become more available, uh, the THCA will play into this equation of what we're looking for in medicines. Uh, I listed a few other cannabinoids. Uh, this is a growing list as we learn more about these individual cannabinoids and their therapeutic uses. We're beginning to speak about type 1 cannabis as the con conventional marijuana with a THC to CBD ratio of around 100 to 1. It may be 50 to 1 or so, it may be 150 to 1, but THC dominates and most strains of marijuana are this kind of cannabis. Type 2 is the CBD uh, THC of more of a balanced proportion and the type 3 is uh, considered the fiber type which might be more in this range of 20 to 1 CBD to THC. Uh, there are a rare number of these strains. Uh, we're learning about them day by day, and they are being propagated around the world so that people do have access, as you well know, to these high CBD strains. Acid cannabinoids, I was mentioning a bit earlier, when the plant is green, the THC is predominantly in the THCA form. Not entirely, there is some THC there as well in the, in the living plant, but most of the uh, THC is in the THCA form. It is gradually decarboxylated with drying, it's rapidly decarboxylated, when you uh, put it into some heat for a while and warm it up. And this is basically what's happening in that number two position on the THC molecule. The carboxyl group is attached. As you heat it, the CO2 comes off and you decarboxylate it into the, quote, active form of the THC. I really don't prefer the use of the word active because the THC is active as well. It's just that it is uh, the non-decarboxylated form a valuable medicine when it comes to finding uh, what works best for somebody. You may not want to have as much psychoactivity. You may prefer a green extracted cannabis product in order to optimize your therapy. So acid cannabinoids are unstable. So if you have a bottle of what you think is an acid cannabinoid tincture, let's say, you don't want to leave it on the dashboard of the car. You don't want to leave it exposed to a lot of light. You don't want to even have a lot of friction to warm it up and, and alter the molecule. It will gradually uh, or rapidly decarboxylate depending on applying heat. Uh, so these, um, these forms, uh, well, let's see. Heated, burned, vaporized, baked, and most processed cannabis extracts are devoid of the acid cannabinoids. So by the time we get to the point of of processing the plant, we're going to often, uh, you know, reduce or eliminate all of these acid forms. There's some other therapeutic considerations that I like people to be aware of, the cannabinoid synergism I'll speak of, the whole plant versus single molecule, CBD is another, and cannabis as an adaptogen is another and tolerance and autoregulation. The synergism, I'm going to show a couple slides that quite well demonstrates this. There's one slide that I'm going to show you for whole plant CBD versus single molecule CBD, which shows a, a um, bell-shaped curve to where with low dose of the single molecule CBD, you don't have an effect. And as you go up on dose, you get a peak effect but then if you keep going higher on the dose of CBD, it falls off again. So it is a bell-shaped curve effect that disappears as you go up on dose. 
comparing that to the CBD in a whole plant extract, as in the ACDC strains and the Charlotte Webb strains that you've been hearing about, these are the whole plant extracts. You don't see this bell-shaped curve, it's linear, so the bigger the dose, the bigger effect, not only in reducing uh, pain in animal models, but in uh, reducing swelling and inflammation as well. Cannabis is an adaptogen. Let me just simply say it this way. If we have a product that we're taking at bedtime to get a good night's sleep, and you use the same product in the morning, it's not gonna make you go to sleep. You're gonna get up and go. So the body really knows what it needs. It's an adaptogen. Cannabinoids, cannabis is an adaptogen. It works in the ways that you need it the most. So you don't have to be particularly worried about the idea that, oh, I'm using an indica that's going to knock my socks off. Well, maybe it will when you need your socks knocked off. But it's not going to necessarily be that way the next day in the morning when you're out the door. You can take a dose and be able to uh, continue your therapy. As you get tolerant of cannabis, it becomes uh, quite acceptable in terms of functionality and being impaired. Again, this is dose dependent, so you do have to watch the total amount of dosing that you're, you're talking about. Tolerance and autoregulation, if I were to remind you again of that receptor sitting in the cell membrane, if you take cannabis on a regular basis, particularly in large doses, the cannabinoid receptor comes out of the membrane and back into the cell. It internalizes. This internalization is auto-regulated by the body. As a lot of cannabinoid is available, the body knows that it doesn't need as many receptors. So it down-regulates the receptor population. That can be triggered in order to get a better response, a greater therapeutic window, if you will. So if you go into a couple day hiatus of cannabis use, you reset your cannabinoid receptors. They populate the cell membranes again, and you have a, a, more, a, a stronger effect. So we can use a, a brief um, hiatus on cannabis use to trigger uh, a, an improvement in the therapeutic window where a lower dose seems to be effective. Uh, moving on, the synergism both in Dr. Costa's research in Italy, she showed that the cannabis extracts worked better in rat model neuropathic pain than did the individual molecules. THC worked on the pain, CBD worked on the pain, but if you took the, the combination of the two or a whole plant extract, it worked far better on the pain. So again, the synergism of these molecules is quite noticeable in the animal models. And then in the Marku McAllister data that came out, gosh, it's been over seven years ago now, uh, I'm gonna show you these graphics because I think they're quite impressive. Let me start with this one. This is growing human glioblastoma cells in test tubes. For those of you who haven't seen this, the column on the left is simply representing the tumor cells growing with nutrient only. The second column, where it says no CBD, is adding that particular concentration of THC, 5.4 micromolar per liter, and it knocks down the growth of those tumor cells that much, or at least the viability of those cells that much. In the next black column to the right, CBD is added at this relatively low concentration, and we can see it knock down the viability of the cells. And then look to the far right. That's the two at the, together of the THC and the CBD on the right-hand column, which is a very low column representing just a couple percent of cells survive with these doses of THC and CBD combined. Again, this is the synergism of the two molecules together. So we really can feel confident that if we're giving something for going after cancer cells, at least the glioblastoma cells, we will find that we have a better response when we have THC and CBD there together. The bigger dose of THC, the bigger is the suppression of the viability. And I'll go back a slide to show what I mean. This is about a third of the amount of THC and about a half of the amount of CBD. Uh, in both situations, the columns are a bit taller. And toggling back to the, the last slide, a little higher dose shows that these columns are further suppressed. So this is a dose response. The bigger the dose, the bigger the effect. 
And that really lends to the idea that in cancer treatment, sometimes these tumors are very sensitive and it doesn't take a very big dose. And other times, we take the liberty of giving high doses in the effort to see if the tumor will respond. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, in terms of actually killing cancer cells. In terms of symptom re relief, you're gonna get symptom relief. Uh, it's just whether we're going after the tumor, we may decide to go from you know, a few milligrams for symptom relief up to hundreds of milligrams to see if we can actually stop the growth of the tumor. And many of these tumors do respond to high doses. Here's that bell-shaped curve uh, versus a increasing response of uh, comparing CBD to the whole plant extract. And if I had a pointer, I don't believe I have, you'll see that in the upper left-hand corner, we do have this bell-shaped curve. It's inverted, but there it is, with uh, the paw thickness minimizing with the mid-dose around the five my, a milligram per kilogram, but then as you give a bigger dose, the swelling seems to occur greater. And on the right-hand side, this is what we're seeing with the whole plant extract, where the bigger the dose, the bigger the effect. Uh, similarly, on the bottom, this is a pain threshold uh, model with the animal. And again, we see something uh, uh, basically a, appearing to be a bell-shaped curve on the bottom left and then a linear line of response on the right, comparing again the single molecule CBD to the whole plant CBD. So if people are online finding CBD, we don't know what you're getting in these products that are coming out of Asia or coming out of Eastern Europe. They may be processed from waste material from the plant uh, fiber industry or from other industries using hemp fiber. Uh, we don't know what the process is. We don't know about pesticides. We don't know about a lot of the particulars of these products that are available online. So I would just offer some caution when you're, particular, when you're using these products as to uh, what you're getting. If they are single molecule CBD, by the time you get to it, uh, you may have to be uh, dealing with this bell-shaped curve response. So advances in cannabinoid therapy, I would say we have a greater selection of non-psychotropic cannabinoids, starting with CBD and THCA and others in order to uh, try to have better targeted therapies with less psychoactivity. Many conditions in which frequent use is indicated, a CBD dominant low THC strain may prove to be a best choice in conditions such as anxiety and hepatitis. We do know that CBD is able to kill off the activated stellate cells that are responsible in the liver for fibrosis. So if people are having problems with fibrotic livers, uh, with uh, whatever the cause is, whether it's hepatitis C or alcoholism or whatever the cause, CBD may be effective in reducing the fibrosis response. Uh, THCA may be a good substitute for THC. I think I've mentioned this already as it has very little psychoactivity. Uh, again, the biggest thing is whether that's really THCA in the, in the product. Uh, again, you can't cook it or bake it because you're gonna decarboxylate it. And then finally here, processed oils typically forfeit much of their volatile fraction or the terpenes, uh, which are lost when you use heat. We do have limitations. There are social and legal issues. I'd love to see Australia go the route of just decriminalizing cannabis. It really is, uh, it just makes sense. We want to see these medicines be available to people, and they are so harmless. It just doesn't make sense, and particularly comparing to the pharmaceuticals that we're dealing with. We have, uh, for example, you know, we had a, on the market a few years ago a COX-2 inhibitor called Viox. There were 55,000 cardiovascular deaths before it was removed from the market. You know, it went, through, it went through the RCTs, it went through the random controlled trials. But, you know, these are dependent upon who's doing the tests and, uh, you know, what, the, what outcomes they're looking for and they don't really necessarily care about it as far as the, uh, the adverse effects of these chemicals if they're making big profits. Eventually the bean counters will say, okay, too many lawsuits, pull it off the market. 
That's kind of the way that it seems to be working with the pharmaceutical industry, at least in the United States. Cost can be an issue. Some of these products are rather expensive, and they really need not be. Uh, limited access to products that are cleanly grown and produced with specific cannabinoid ratios, they're not always available, but they can be, and it's just a matter of time before they will be. Risk of discovery is a problem for people. I've got, you know, grandpas or grandmas that are going to pick up the kids in the afternoon from school, and they may be using cannabinoids in their, in their, as part of their medicines. They don't want to be discovered as being uh, under the influence of cannabinoids. They may be perfectly capable of driving safely, but they just are worried that discovery will be a problem to them. Altered performance, yes, of course, this is a problem, and high doses of THC will alter performance. Uh, Short-term memory loss uh, can be a problem, but again, it disappears rather quickly uh, with uh, ab abstaining. And then the adverse effects are pretty insignificant. I'll list some more in, in another slide coming up. Considerations, we have to identify the risks and benefits for every patient. Vape pens are discreet and convenient, they're nifty, uh, but we don't know certain things about them. And I'd like to point out that uh, we have problems with this residual solvents and vehicles such as propylene glycol. When propylene glycol is b burned, there is produced a, uh, a carcinogen. So we don't really want anything but the pure full extract cannabis oil in a vape pen. If you hold a vape pen up, and turn it upside down and right side up and it's running from one side of the tube to the other, that's not full extract oil. You want to demand that they're using products that are really just that oil. We still have risks of metals getting into the vapor. They, the metals are in the vapor. And over a lifetime, this may be a problem. Uh, we also may have contaminants that you don't know about as far as whether this product was grown organically or not. So vape pens, though convenient and simple and easy, and in a person that's 80 years old and treating chronic pain, I, I encourage people to use vape pens, but I think the safer products are the vaporizers that are using the whole plant rather than the extracted oils where you may not know about the pedigree of the oil, if you will. Smoked flowers are easy to titrate. It's preferred method of administration in my patient population, though it is problematic as a respiratory irritant, and in some cases it's just inappropriate. Ingested forms, slow onset of action, long duration of action. So often I'm using both forms in patients with problem uh, conditions where they really need both. Uh, suppository forms I think we've talked enough about. Precautions. In the neophyte, anxiety and panic may occur. Uh, a certain amount of just education goes a long way in having people understand what they're doing and then starting the dose low. I really like to start dosing to where the, the THC is probably not going to be even a milligram uh, or significantly more than a milligram of THC initially where they're not going to feel it. And then they're going to develop some confidence about using this medicine and then ramp the dose up in order to get the desired effect. Syncope can occur, particularly in dabbing. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing the dabbing in this population here in, in Australia, but by taking these full extract oils or oils that have been extracted with um, butane, for example, and then taking a hit on that, you may get a whole joint in one toke. And what happens is the cannabinoid receptors in the, ves in the blood vessels are rapidly saturated, vasodilate, and down you go. We're seeing people break their skulls open and break their shoulders and arms by taking a puff like that and falling over uh, unconscious for a brief time. Otherwise, not particularly harmful. It's just not what I would consider a medicinal use of cannabis. Smoking causes bronchitis, no COPD or emphysema or cancers. There's ample evidence that this is the case. Habit forming, yeah. If taking a medicine that works is habit forming, I'll go along with habit forming. <laughs> it is not addictive, and there's very little or no withdrawal, as much as the government and my government would have you believe that there is. Uh, drug drug interactions we've spoken of. There is an association to this hyperemesis syndrome. There's something about resetting of the cannabinoid receptors. 
that does occur when people are using cannabis on a regular basis. Occasionally, they'll get into this vomiting syndrome. They love to take a hot shower for comfort, and then after about a day of abstention, they seem to come out of it, and their cannabinoid receptors are essentially reset, and they can go about using cannabis as medicine thereafter. I think I've seen it five times in 2,500 patients, so it doesn't occur very often, but it does occur, and I, th I think it's just something to be aware of. Human fetal and neonatal development appears to be unharmed. And this is kind of a theme that I see going on again here in Australia as we deal with it in California or in the United States. And that's the idea that we're holding cannabis to a, a much more rigorous standard than we hold the other pharmaceuticals. It just isn't right. We, we, you know, I, I don't know that I need to elaborate. You get it. Conditions, this is rank order of the conditions I'm treating in my practice. More than half of my patients are there for pain. Chronic pain, acute pain, inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain, and in all cases, they're getting benefits with the use of cannabis. Mental disorders of all kinds. Probably top of the list would be anxiety, uh, PTSD, and then on into any of the mood disorders can benefit with the use of cannabis. Cancers of many kinds, and that's really a topic for another discussion, but uh, many cancers seem to be responsive, certainly in terms of symptomatic release, relief, and in many cases, we're seeing the disappearance of lesions altogether. Gastrointestinal disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcer disease, esophageal reflux, the list is long in the conditions that cannabis is beneficial in for gastrointestinal disease. Insomnia. A few people initially using cannabis will be kind of alerted and, aw and awakened at night with use of cannabis for the first few doses. But if they continue beyond the first couple nights, they'll usually find that the quality and duration of their sleep is much improved. I uniformly hear that, but I do find that some people don't get past that first night where they're going to use a dose and then their, gar their mind is in the garden. You know, they're just out there and having a good time and realizing after an hour of lying there that they're not falling asleep. So they're thinking, oh, this isn't going to work for me. I just encourage them to persevere, stay with it, and they usually do fine. CBD-rich cannabis uh, is not your best choice. Getting THC in the bedtime dose of cannabis is very useful for sleep. Migraine, harm reduction, getting away from opioids, but also benzos and all kinds of other drugs. I just uniformly see people reducing the amount of conventional pharmaceuticals when they're using cannabis on a regular basis. Spastic disorders of any kind benefit with cannabis. Autoimmune disorders is quite remarkable to me in approving it for lupus, for example. I'll see them and then they disappear. Their, their diseases are often just gone, gone quiet if they're using cannabis on a regular basis. Other diseases, autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, you know, it's a mixed bag. Some people haven't had a flare-up since they started using cannabis. Other people need to stay on the whole variety of inflammatory drugs in order to gain, get their best advantage. So it's, it's just uh, quite different from person to person as far as the autoimmune disorders. Neurogenitive diseases pretty much uniformly benefit uh, glaucoma. Uh, I'll say some more about this tomorrow, but uh, yes, it reduces intraocular pressure, but another thing it's doing is neuroprotection. So even though the pressure may be elevated, the nerves are protected by the cannabinoids, so they don't seem to suffer the same deterioration. Skin diseases, I've mentioned a bit. Then this catch-all, and I could add a lot more conditions to this, epilepsy, autism. I love to see the effect in autism. It's quite dramatic. And the kids that are, that are changing just, you know, in days in front of their families who have been so, you know, involved in their, patient, in their child's care with autism. It's just overwhelming to a family dynamic. And you get these kids started on cannabinoids and their life changes. So I really encourage people to look at autism as an excellent patient population to use cannabinoids, including THC. I've had patients with autism try the CBD only and not get responses. They get more balanced medicines and they do much better. 
Tourette's, ADD, dystonias, dementias. I'm going around making house calls on patients with dementias and going to the nursing facilities. When we're plagued with bad behaviors, agitated behaviors, we just go up on the THC until we get the behavior uh, changes, and it does work quite well in that way. So it's just a matter of titrating the dose up to what we need. It may be a couple milligrams of THC with CBD included is an adequate dose, but in other people it's gonna take five or 10 milligrams, even as much as 30 milligrams of THC per dose in order to get an optimal effect. So we titrate the dose. You gotta look at the patient and listen to the staff or the families and then make dosage uh, adjustments in order to get the benefit that you're seeking. AIDS and other infections, it helps with appetite. And you know, in that animal study, I have to believe that I spoke of earlier that the HIV patients are benefiting in more than just reduction of nausea or vomiting or uh, appetite stimulation. They are probably getting some significant benefits in dealing with this, these viral illnesses, hep C included. I like to offer patients, especially uh, my patients that are naive to cannabis, a treatment plan that I send them home with. So I'll check a box and say, okay, I want you to try this or I want you to try that. And I'll send them out the door with instructions as to which kind of ratio of cannabinoids we might be seeking and what methods of administration we may be uh, encouraging them to use. Uh, this goes on to the frequency of use and the suggested doses. Again, here's dosing that I might start with a milligram to two and a half milligrams. Usually I'm speaking of THC and not CBD. You can go to hundreds of milligrams, as you've been hearing, of CBD and not have any problem with it. But THC, you're gonna be uh, causing some psychoactivity and some people, they find that distressing. So you start low and build up slowly in order to reach the desired effect. Microdosing is possible, and something in the order of less than a milligram per day in some people may be effective. But my experience is much more inclined to be in this range of one to 10 milligrams per dose of THC as an effective dose for most conditions. Target dose, I like to point out what I think is a target minimum dose and a target maximum dose. If I'm dealing with a patient with a, a difficult cancer, a pancreatic cancer, a hepatic cancer, a glioblastoma, I may say that our optimal dose is up to a gram of cannabinoids a day. Mixed cannabinoids, THC and CBD. And in, I may alter the dosing to where I'm gonna give them CBD uh, dominant strains in the daytime just so that they can function depending on what's going on in their life. They may still be trying to work, for example. Uh, so if they're not and they're, they're just home convalescing from surgery of resecting a GBM, then I'm gonna probably put them on balanced THC CBD as an optimal cannabinoid ratio. Uh, but dosing may get up to as much as a gram of oils a day hundreds of milligrams, and tolerance is very interesting to watch. I, I sent a fellow home not long ago and I said, I want you to start at a, just a, you know, a speck, just a poppy seed amount of full extract cannabis oil. Let's estimate maybe a couple milligrams, five milligrams, maybe as, well, probably five milligrams of THC. And then titrate slowly up to a gram of cannabis oil a day after about a month. Well, I sent the guy home and he said, ah, fooey, I'm all in. <laughs> he took the whole gram of cannabis oil, first time right off. He and his wife looked at each other and just had to start laughing because he was a lump on the couch. <laughs> he couldn't do a thing. I mean, he could go to the bathroom, he could eat, he could drink. He was safe. He had used cannabis in his youth. He wasn't frightened, but he was totally incapacitated. The next day, he took the gram a day. Once a day, he took the gram of oil. So he wanted to get right to it as far as seeing if this was gonna work on his cancer. He is five years since that time, actually it, maybe four years ago when we sent him home with that instruction. And he's still surviving quite well with his cancer, but it hasn't entirely disappeared either. On the fifth day of taking a gram of oil a day, he got up from the couch and started acting normally. Here's your tolerance development. This is built in. Again, the cannabinoid receptors are internalizing. You're not gonna get as high. You're still gonna have the non, 
tar non-receptor targets for cannabinoids fighting the cancer, but you're not going to have nearly the degree of psychoactivity. And he said, I felt fine. I could drive a car. I could do anything. He had his wife's agreement prior to treatment that he wasn't going to drive, so he didn't. But he did go through this trial of of high-dose cannabis, developed the tolerance, and then went on quite normally from that point on, continuing with a gram of oil a day. So understand that tolerance is our friend, and we really utilize this in our efforts to design treatments. So I've thrown a few footnotes here. I like to think that all of the products that we're encouraging people to get are organic, organically grown and produced. Uh, products uh, should have accurately measured cannabinoid content and terpene content when that is available. Uh, especially in dealing with elderly people, I just tell the families and the caregivers to hold the dose of too, sl too sleepy. So you've worked up to a dose and maybe that's going to work most of the time, but if somebody's too sleepy, you're not going to force them to take a dose. Uh, it kind of goes without saying. And then drug-drug interactions we already have uh, discussed up uh, a little earlier. So, um, you know, I think that this is kind of the gist of the way I approach patients. I try to teach this information to most every patient or their families when they come to see me for a cancer consultation for as a new patient. It takes a while. It takes an hour and a half for my initial visit. I do two hours for my initial visit on kids. It just takes that long in order to have everybody on the same page. So, you know, in conclusion, I would just encourage you to understand and, and hold close to the fact that these are enormously safe molecules. You can't kill yourself with them, well, lest you want to try to smoke 1,500 pounds in an hour. <laughs> so I do appreciate your attention, and thank you very much. Uh, what a brilliant presentation. I think there might be some questions. In fact, you're the next speaker, aren't you? So. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Barakat Shifkaran has uh, reminded me that there is a drug-drug interaction for those who might not have heard with warfarin. So it is important to watch the um, anticoagulant effects while on, on high doses of cannabinoids. So thank you for that comment. Thank you very much, and thank you for a very compelling uh, presentation. Um, just brilliant, and I think um, many of us um, have gained um, extra and more in-depth insight. Uh, so into your into 26 years, actually, um, in emergency medicine and private general practice. Um, that includes the use of cannabis since 1977. So a man that knows what he speaks of. Um, so please, um, everyone, thank um, the wonderful uh, Dr. Hergen, Hergen rather. And um, I'd just also like to give him this gift on behalf of United in Compassion. Too. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.